from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Library of Congress. My name is Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Center. Uh, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to this afternoon's event celebrating the poetry of Pablo Neruda and featuring Forrest Gander and Marjorie Agosin. Uh, first, let me ask you to do what I'm going to do, which is to turn off those wonderful electronic devices that you have um, to make sure that they don't interfere with this afternoon's event. Um, second, I'd like to note that this program is being recorded and by participating, you give us permission for future use of the recording. Uh, tonight's event is co-sponsored by the library's Hispanic Division and the Poetry and Literature Center. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the center. We are home to the Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, uh, the first acting Hispanic Poet Laureate, Juan Felipe Herrera, who is a force of nature. And um, despite trying, uh, in addition to despite, I guess that's a Freudian slip. In addition to uh, trying to keep up with Juan Felipe, we put on 30 to 40 programs like this throughout the year. Uh, to find out more about our series and our programs uh, and other literary programs at the Library of Congress, you can sign our sign-up sheet outside. Um, you can also visit our website, www.loc.gov poetry. Talia Guzman Gonzalez, reference librarian from the Hispanic Division, will now introduce the event. Please join me in welcoming her. Hello and welcome everyone on this very special day, February 14th. <laughs> um, I am a reference librarian in the Hispanic Division, and I would like to this, um, present our to uh, presenters today. First, uh, Marjorie Agosin was born, I just learned, very close to the Library of Congress, right here in Bethesda, Maryland, but le left very, very early to, be, uh, to live in Chile, where she was raised. Her family moved to the United States soon before the coup that installed Augusto Pinochet back to the States. Agosin earned her bachelor's from the University of Georgia and a master's and PhD from Indiana University. In both her scholarship and her creative work, she focuses on social justice, feminism, and remembrance. In, 18, in 1986, Agostin published the book Pablo Neruda as part of Twain's World Authors series, a series of literary criticism offering in-depth introductions to the lives and works of writers, the history and influence of literary movements, and the development of literary genres. Agostin is the author of numerous works of poetry, fiction, and literary criticism. Her collections include The Angel of Memory, The Alphabet in My Hands, A Writing Life, Always from Somewhere Else, A Memoir of My Chilean Jewish Father, An Absence of Shadows, Melodious Women, and A Crossroads and a Star, Memoirs of a Jewish Girl in Chile, among others. Agostin has received many uh, uh, honors and awards for her writing and work as a human rights activist, including a Janet Rankin Award in Human Rights and a United Nations Leadership Award for Human Rights. The Chilean government honored her with a Gabriela Mistral Medal for Lifetime Achievement. Agosin is the Luella Lamer Slainer Professor in Latin American Studies and a professor of Spanish at Wesley, Wellesley College. Forrest Gander uh, was born in, the, in California and grew up in Virginia and attended the College of William and Mary where he majored in geology. After earning an MA in literature from San Francisco State University, Gander moved to Mexico, then to Arkansas, where his poetry, informed by his knowledge of geology, turned its attention to landscape as foreground or source of action. He is the author of 13 poetry collections and two novels, including Eye Against Eye, Torn Awake, and Science and Steeple Flower. He is the editor of Mouth to Mouth, 12 Contemporary Mexican Women, 
a bilingual anthology of contemporary Mexican poets, and the translator of No Shelter, the selected poems of Pura Lopez Colomé. Gander's critically acclaimed translations of Pablo Neruda are included in the Essential Neruda Selected Poems from 2004, and in uh, 2016, he published a bilingual edition of 20 previously unknown and unseen Neruda poems, which are presenting here uh, today. Then come back the lost Neruda. He won the Penn Translation Award for the book The Night by Bolivian poet Jaime Sáenz. Gander has won the Witting Writers Award, a Howard Foundation Award, the Jessica Noble Maxwell Memorial Prize, two Gertrude Stein Awards for Innovative North American Writing, and fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Guggenheim Foundation, and the United, Art, uh, United States Artist. He has taught at Harvard and Brown University. And also, last but not least, the man of the hour who is making all this possible, Pablo Neruda. He's, he is the author of more than 50 books, including the poetry collections, 20 Poemas de Amor y una Canción Desesperada, 20 Love Poems and a Song of Despair, Residencia en la Tierra, Residence on Earth, and Alturas de Machu Picchu, The Heights of Machu Picchu, as well as his autobiography, Confieso que he vivido, Memorias. In 1971, Neruda was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. His other honors include the National Prize for Literature of Chile, the International Peace Prize, and the Stalin Peace Prize. Alongside a prolific literary career, Neruda served as a Chilean diplomat and sought a career in politics. In 1945, he was elected senator of the republic as a member of the Communist Party. Uh, which was outlawed four years later. The poet sought exile in Mexico and later toured Europe and Asia. He returned to Santiago, Chile in 1952, where he continued to write until his death in 1973. I wanna take this opportunity to invite you to also listen to Pablo Neruda uh, in the archive of Hispanic literature on tape, curated by the Hispanic Division. Um, we have some flyers outside for you to access, learn to access the archive and our marvelous collection. So, and because it is always wonderful to have poets, and in this case, poets, right, reading to you, please join me in welcoming um, Forrest Gander and Marjorie Agustin. Thank you. One more thing before I forget. Uh, we'll have questions at the end of the program, and Forrest will be reading some poems for us now. Okay. Thank you. So we will start with your readings. You will read a poem in English, and then Marjorie will read it in Spanish. All right. So one person who wasn't introduced here is Georgette Dorn, um, who's been like the anchor of the Hispanic literature program here at the Library of Congress for a very long time and um, I'm also I'm really glad to be here with um, Marjorie who's uh, been also a really significant um, figure as both a poet and a, a translator and an advocate um, for poetry and in and, and for Latin American poetry for as, as long as I've been writing. And, yeah, gracias. <clears throat> so, um, happy Valentine's Day. Um, I love that uh, you, you came out to listen to Neruda, Valentine's Day. Um, so we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll read a couple poems. I think we need to start, Marjorie, no, with a, with a love poem, eh? <clears throat> um, so this, um, this is a poem called, um, let's see, I'm not sure what, my numbers are going to be different than yours. Never Alone with You. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the things I like in this poem a lot is the way that the figure of the be beloved mixes with the figure of the landscape. And this is something for someone as heterosexual as Pablo Neruda, it's kind of interesting to think that one way of reading his work is that the two greatest influences on him 
were um, a gay man, man and a gay woman, um, Walt Whitman um, and Gabriela Mistral. And it's Gabriela Mistral, some of her more complex poetry that mixes landscape and psyche in a way that I think influences Neruda. So these poems, as Georgette asked me to tell you, were, were just discovered three years ago. Um, Matilda Rutia, uh, Neruda's wife, had been through all of his stuff, but not as carefully as Dario Oasis, the, um, the head of the Neruda Foundation in Chile, um, uh, who, after, um, after Neruda's widow's death, began to go through and document all of the materials and began to find things written on the backs of napkins, written on menus, um, stuffed in other manuscripts that no one had seen. They were completely unseen poems. And um, when I heard about it, I thought, oh, this is terrible. And when they published a book three years ago in, in, uh, in Spain, Latin America, I thought, oh, they're just squeezing stuff Neruda really didn't want to have published and, um, and making a dollar on it. And then I saw the reviews, and the reviews were startlingly good. And then I had the opportunity to translate the work and looked at it, and, you know, it was Neruda. It was the real thing. So I was really pleased to get to do it. it this one, listen, listen to the, how the eroticism is mixed with the landscape. Never alone with you over the earth crossing through fire. Never alone with you in the forests finding again dawn's stiff arrow, the tender moss of spring with you in my struggle, not the one I chose, but the only one, with you through the streets and sand, with you my love, my exhaustion, the bread, the wine, poverty and glint of one coin, wounds, sorrow, happiness, all the light, shadows, stars, all the cut wheat, the corollas of giant sunflowers, defeated by their very fullness, the cormorant's flight nailed to the sky like a coastline cross. All the space, the autumn, the carnations, never alone with you, never alone with you, earth, with you, the sea, my life, all I am, all I give, and everything I sing. The substance of this, love, the earth, the sea, bread, a life. Thank you very much. I'm also uh, very honored and happy to be here with uh, all of you, the Library of Congress, with Georgette and Forrest that I've never met personally, but I feel I do know them. So it's a wonderful opportunity. And also to, uh, to celebrate love, hope, sensuality, and the world will be a much better place if everyone, even presidents, <laughs> read poetry more often. So I'll read in Spanish uh, Neruda's poem, and you will hear, will remember the beautiful translation of Forrest. Nunca solo contigo, por la tierra, atravesando el fuego. Nunca solo contigo, por los bosques, recogiendo la flecha entumecida de la aurora el tierno musgo de la primavera, contigo en mi batalla, no la que yo escogí, sino la única, contigo por las calles y la arena, contigo, el amor, el cansancio, el pan, el vino, la pobreza y el sol de una moneda, las heridas, la pena, la alegría, toda la luz, la sombra, las estrellas, todo el trigo cortado, las corolas del girasol gigante doblegadas por su propio caudal, el vuelo del cormorán clavado al cielo como cruz marina, todo el espacio, el otoño, 
los claveles, nunca solo, contigo, nunca solo, contigo tierra, contigo el mar, la vida, cuánto soy, cuánto doy y cuánto canto, esta materia, amor, la tierra, el mar, el pan, la vida. Marjorie wanted to read this one, which I haven't read um, before out loud. Um, do you want to read it in Spanish first? Do you want to hear it in Spanish first or English first? Uh huh. You have a choice. <laughs> what, what did you say? Español a principio. Poema 4. ¿Qué entrega a tu mano de oro la hoja de otoño que canta? ¿O vas tú repartiendo ceniza en los ojos del cielo? ¿O a ti te rindió la manzana su luz olorosa? ¿O tú decidiste el color del océano en complicidad con la ola? ¿Ha sido la ley de la lluvia cambiar la sustancia del llanto, caer y elevar, educar el amargo silencio con lanzas que el viento y el tiempo transforman en hojas y aromas? ¿Y se sabe que el día entusiasta corriendo en su carro de trigo es un movimiento florido de un ciclo de sombra en el mundo? Y yo me pregunto, si tú no trabajas tejiendo el estaño secreto del blanco navío que cruza la noche nocturna, o si de tu sangre minúscula no nace el color del durazno, si no son tus manos profundas las que hacen que fluya los ríos, si no hacen tus ojos abiertos en medio del cielo en verano que caiga del sol a la tierra, su espada amarilla, entonces recorre su rayo cruzando tu copa incitante, arenas, corolas, volcanes, jazmines, desiertos, raíces y lleva tu esencia a los huevos del bosque, a la rosa furiosa de los abejorros, avispas, leones, serpientes, halcones y muerden y pican y clavan y rompen tus ojos llorando, pues fue tu semilla en la tierra, tu barrio impetuoso, el que repartió por la tierra la lengua del sol iracundo. Reposa tu pura cadera y el arco de flechas mojadas extienden la noche los pétalos que forman tu forma, que suban tus piernas de arcilla, el silencio y su clara escalera, peldaño a peldaño, volando conmigo en el sueño, yo siento que asciendes entonces el árbol sombrío que canta en la sombra. Oscura es la noche del mundo sin ti, amada mía, y apenas diviso el origen, apenas comprendo el idioma, con dificultades de cifro las hojas de los eucaliptos. Por eso, si extiendes tu cuerpo y de pronto, en la sombra sombría, asciende tu sangre en el río del tiempo y escucho que pasa a través de mi amor la cascada del cielo y que tú formas parte del fuego que corre escribiendo mi genealogía. Me otorgué tu vida dorada a la rama que necesitaba, la flor, que dirige las vidas y las continúa, el trigo que muere en el pan y reparte la vida, el barro que tiene los dedos más suaves del mundo, los trenes que silban a través de las ciudades salvajes, el monto de los alelíes, el peso del oro en la tierra, la espuma que sigue al navío naciendo y muriendo y el ala del ave marina que vuela en la ola como en un campanario. 
Yo paso mi angosta mirada por el territorio terrible de aquellos volcanes que fueron el fuego natal, la agonía, las selvas que ardieron, hasta las pavesas con pumas y pájaros. Y tú, compañera, tal vez eres hijas del humo, tal vez no sabías que vienes del parto del fuego y la furia. La lava encendida formó con relámpagos tu boca morada, tu sexo en el mujo del roble quemado como una sortija en un nido, tus dedos allí entre las llamas, tu cuerpo compacto salió de las hojas del fuego y en eso recuerdo que aún es posible observar tu remoto linaje de panadería, aún eres pan de la selva, ceniza del trigo violento. Son. Oh, amor de la muerte a la vida, una hoja del bosque, otra hoja. Se pudre el follaje orgulloso en el suelo, el palacio del aire y del trino, la casa suntuosa vestida de verde, decae la sombra en el agua, en el escalofrío. Se sabe que allí germinaron en la podredumbre mojada semillas sutiles y vuelve la acacia a elevar su perfume en el mundo, mi amor, mi escondida, mi dura paloma, mi ramo de noche, mi estrella de arena. La seguridad de tu estirpe de rosa bravía acude a las guerras de mi alma quemando en la altura la clara fogata y marcho en la selva rodeado por los elefantes heridos. Resuena un clamor de tambores que llaman mi voz en la lluvia y marcho, acompaño mis pasos a mi desvarío, hasta ese momento en que surge tu torre y tu cúpula y encuentro, extendiendo la mano, tus ojos silvestres que estaba mirando mi sueño y la cepa de aquellos quebrantos. La hora delgada creció como crece la luna delgada en su cielo, creció navegando en el aire sin prisa y sin mancha. Y no supimos que tú y yo formábamos parte de su movimiento. Ni solo cabellos, idiomas, arterias, orejas componen la sombra del hombre, sino como un hilo, una hebra más dura que nada y que nadie el tiempo subiendo y gastando y creciendo en la hora delgada, buscando los muros de Angol a la luz del rocío en la niebla, supimos que ya no existían. Quedó devorado en la guerra el bastión de madera maciza y apenas surgía en la luz moribunda. La sombra o la huella o el polvo de un hueso quemado. Los bosques del sur soñoliento cubrieron con enredaderas la guerra y la paz de los muertos, la ira y la sangre remota. 64 años arrastra este siglo y 60 en este año llevaba los míos ahora. ¿De quién son los ojos que miran los números muertos? ¿Quién eres, amigo, enemigo de mi paz errante? ¿Sabes cómo fueron los días la crónica las revoluciones, los viajes, las guerras, las enfermedades, las inundaciones, el tiempo que a veces pareció un soldado vencido, cómo se gastaron zapatos corriendo por las oficinas de otoño, qué hacían los hombres dentro de una mina en la altura plateada de Chuquicamata o en el mar Antártico de Chile, infinito, dentro de un navío cubierto de nieve. No importa. Mis pasos antiguos tiran enseñando y cantando lo amargo y eléctrico de este tiempo impuro y radioso que tuvo colmillos de llena, camisas atómicas y alas de relámpago. Para ti, que tienes los ojos que aún no han nacido, abriré las páginas de hierro y rocío de un siglo maldito y bendito, de un siglo moreno con color de hombres oscuros y boca oprimida, que cuando viví comenzaron a tener conciencia y alcantarillado, a tener banderas que fueron tiñendo los siglos a fuerza. 
de sangre y suplicio. It did end. <laughs> read that whole thing because it would take up, I think, it's the longest poem in the book, and it would take up the most time. I think I'll read the very end of it, and then we'll read one more shorter poem, and then um, maybe we can have a discussion. I'm really interested in the things you have to say and in what uh, Georgette Dorn has to say also. Does that seem okay? Okay. So this is, um, this is the, the end of, of that um, beautiful poem. Um, uh, so the, the um, well, it doesn't have a name. Oh, it's number four. Number cuatro. Sixty-four years this century drags along, and sixty of them this year are mine. Now whose eyes stare into the dead numbers? Who are you? friend, enemy of my errant peace. You know how the days went, the chronicle, the revolutions, the trips, the wars, the sicknesses, the deluges, the time that could seem like a, a routed soldier, how shoes wore out racing through the offices of autumn, what the men were doing in a mine on the silvery heights of Chukita, uh, <laughs> um, Chukikamata, or on infinite Chile's Antarctic sea, inside a ship shrouded in snow. No matter, my ancient ways will keep teaching and singing to you of what's bitter and electric in this impure, this radiant time, with its hyena fangs, atomic shirts, and wings of lightning. For you, with eyes yet to be born, I'll open the iron and do pages to a blasted and blessed century, a century gone brown as dark-colored men with tormented mouths, who in my lifetime came into a conscience and decent plumbing, and came to claim a flag stained by centuries of blood and torture. The, the beautiful thing about this edition of uh, the book that Copper Canyon did is that they included um, color holographic plates of um, Neruda's handwriting. And um, because a lot of it is on manuscripts, um, a lot of it you see, and it's the beautiful thing um, for us poets is you see Neruda thinking. You see what he crosses out. Uh, in that first poem that we started with, for instance, um, it starts out with a, a terrible line. Um, he, it starts out with a line in my translation. You are not made of dreams, beloved love, and held to the light you're like an agrarian grape. That's an uva agraria. <clears throat> and you cross that out and start it again with that never alone with you, which worked way better. Um, I think we'll just... Uh, We'll finish here with um, w one of the last poems in the book, um, which Neruda writes during the space race. And um, he's um, gotten a chance to meet uh, a few of the cosmonauts. And he's fascinated, of course, at the beginning of this time, as, as everyone was then, with the notion of um, of what's beyond the Earth, of, of men going away from the earth into, into galactic space. And he has an opportunity to ask one of the cosmonauts, Herman Titoy, um, if he could see Chile from up there. Um, and uh, Titoy said, uh, well, you know, I, I saw some, some mountains down in the southern part of the continent. I'm sure that was Chile. And Neruda was really satisfied that Chile could be seen from deep space. Neruda also had a, uh, the hots for a cosmonaut named Valentina Tereshkova. <laughs> so this the really beautiful poem um, about imagining that space and the first people there. Those two solitary men, 
Those first men up there, what of ours did they bring with them? What from us, the men of earth? It occurs to me that the light was fresh then, that an unwinking star journeyed along, cutting short and linking distances, their faces unused to the awesome desolation in pure space, among astral bodies polished and glistening like grass at dawn. Something new came from the earth, wings or bone coldness, enormous drops of water or surprise thoughts, a strange bird throbbing to the distant human heart. And not only that, but cities, smoke, the roar of crowds, bells and violins, the feet of children leaving school, all of that is alive in space now, from now on, because the astronauts didn't go by themselves. They brought our Earth, the odors of moss and forest, love, the crisscrossed limbs of men and women, terrestrial rains over the prairies. Something floated up like a wedding dress behind the two spaceships. It was our spring on Earth, blooming for the first time that conquered an inanimate heaven, depositing in those altitudes the seed of our kind. Estos dos hombres solos, estos primeros hombres allá arriba que llevaron consigo de nosotros, de nosotros los hombres de la Tierra, se me ocurre que aquella luz fue nueva, aquella estrella aguda que viajaba, que tocaba y cortaba las distancias, aquellos rostros nuevos en la gran soledad, en el espacio puro, entre los astros finos y mojados como la hierba en el amanecer, algo nuevo venía de la tierra, alas o escalofrío, grandes gotas de agua o pensamiento, imprevisto, ave extraña que latía con el distante corazón humano, pero no solo aquello, sino ciudades, humo, ruido de multitudes, campanas y violines, pies de niños saliendo de la escuela. Todo eso en el espacio, Vive ahora, desde ahora, porque los astronautas no iban solos. Llevaban nuestra tierra, olor de mujo y bosque, amor, enlace de hombres y mujeres, lluvia terrestre sobre la pradera. Algo flotaba como un vestido de novia detrás de las dos naves del espacio. Era la primavera de la tierra que florecía por primera vez, que conquistaba el cielo inanimado, dejando en las alturas la semilla del hombre. Um, uh, Georgia Dorn has asked us to read one more. Um, so why don't we do that? Um, this, is, uh, this is dated January 10th, 1973. So it's just before the poet uh, dies. And um, he wrote it in Isla Negra. I've seen, um, if you go visit Neruda's house, um, you'll see houses, three of them, lived well for a communist. Um, <clears throat> you'll see this uh, old fashioned, black phone um, that we remember from like the 50s and 60s that he's talking about here. So we'll, th we'll throw this poem in, I think it's 19, Marjorie, um, to, uh, to give you a sense of his sense of humor and um, the, the loss that it would have been if this poem was never recovered. Um, it's found in a notebook on which the first page the poet writes, I began on the first days of January 1973, sick in bed with a bad hip, this book titled Chosen Defects and Others, Secret Poems. 
and it stayed secret. From isolation, from the hostile bonehead I've always been, since even before I was born, between pride and the terror of living without being loved, I've come to shake hands with all the world, and without wanting to at first, I've let myself take phone calls, <laughs> suffering a voice, some advice through a wire, a metallic transmission, until finally I took leave from myself and raising my arms as though before a pointed gun, I gave in to the degradations of the telephone. I, who conducted myself with such singular tact, backing away from sterile offices, from offensive industrial palaces, only to see some black apparatus that even with its silence insults me. Me, a poet clumsy as a duck on land, degrading myself to the point of yielding my superior ear, which I'd consecrated innocently to birds and music, to this everyday prostitution, affixing my ear to an enemy trying to take control of my being, I came to be a telefiend, a telephony, a sacred telephant. I prostrated myself whenever the ringing of that horrid despot demanded my attention, my ears and blood, when a voice mistakenly asked for technical information or an escort, or it was a rel relative I detested, a forgotten aunt, wholly objectionable, a national prize alcoholic who longed to smack me, or a blue-tinged, syrupy actress who wanted to violate me, seduce me with her pink telephone. <laughs> I've changed clothes, roles, I'm all ears. I live trembling that they won't call me, or that they will, those idiots. My anxiety is medication-proof. Doctors, priests, politician, maybe I'm turning myself into a telephone, an abominable, black lacquered instrument through which others communicate the contempt they'll devote to me when I'm good for nothing but the wasps that converse over my body. They do that didn't live to see smartphones, so. Okay. Del incomunicado, del ignorante, hostil que yo fui siempre desde antes de nacer, entre el orgullo y el terror de vivir sin amado, sin ser amado, pasé a darle la mano a todo el mundo y me dejé telefonear sin ganas, al principio aceptando una voz, un alámbrico consejo, una metálica comunicación, hasta que ya me fui de mí yo mismo y levantando como antes un revólver los brazos me entregué a las degradaciones del teléfono yo que me fui contacto singular alejando de claras oficinas de ofensivos palacios industriales solo de ver un aparato negro que aún silencioso me insultaba yo poeta torpe como pato en tierra fui corrompiéndome hasta conceder mi oreja superior que consagré con inocencia a pájaros y música a una prostitución de cada día, enchufando al oído el enemigo que se fue apoderando de mi ser, pasé a ser telefín, telefonino, telefante sagrado. Me proscaltaba cuando la espantosa campanilla del déspota pedía mi atención, mis orejas y mi sangre, cuando una, ve, una voz equivocadamente preguntaba por técnicos o putas, o era un pariente que yo detestaba, una tía olvidada, inaceptable, un premio nacional alcoholista, que a toda costa quería pegarme, o una actriz tan azul, y almibarada que quería violarme y seducirme empleando un teléfono rosado. He cambiado de ropa, de costumbre, soy solamente orejas. Vivo temblando de que me llamen o de que me llamen los idiotas. Mi ansiedad resistió medicamentos, doctores, sacerdotes, estadistas. 
Tal vez voy convirtiéndome en teléfono, en instrumento abominable y negro, por donde comunique los demás el desprecio que me consagran cuando yo ya no sirva para nada, es decir, para que hablen a través de mi cuerpo las avispas. Talking about 
la pequeña oreja más amada, the little ear, most beloved, um, hecha tal vez de nacar, um, uh, kneaded perhaps with, uh, with a nacre, or uh, uh, con harina de rosa, with rose flour. You know, it's like, what? <laughs> Where is he going? He's like cooking his lover's ear. <laughs> and do, do you know the, the vernacular from? The harina de rosa? No, no, for the um, oreja del mar. Yeah, it was just as you do. No, I'm just curious if, you know, isn't there in the Andes this thing historically with eating people's flesh? They, they so make the official. Uh, uh, it's uh, cannibalism. Yeah, I think yeah, it's official. Right. Yeah, because I, I do know the sea, the Caribbean, and the North Atlantic. Yeah. yeah. Well, it turns out in the, uh, in the 50s, but just for about 10 years, so none of my friends in Chile, and Marjorie, uh, sort of my age, people our age don't know it, Raul Zurita didn't know it, but um, people's grandmothers knew that um, Orja del Mar, for a brief period, was what they called abalone. Uh, abalones are little ears of the sea. Yes. Um, At one point in my life, I'd heard that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like I'm not talking of you know of the little ears of the sea that you cook that are so tasty. No, I'm talking about your ear. Um, what the yeah. And I was very and for many years. How is it possible that these poems were not found by anybody or that he didn't want to publish them? How do you explain that? I mean, I mean maybe Forrest can answer better, but I don't think. He didn't want to publish. I think what a lot of people think that perhaps, you know, because he's, he's perfect and imperfect, and that's what's so beautiful about him, right? Some people say he published too much. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that um, it happened. Um, I don't know. Some people may think that it was a destiny that they were found so many years after Neruda's death and his beloved. Mules, Matilde, and I think it was like a float. They were not found. Matilde missed them, but I think that it's not that they didn't want to publish them. What do you think? No, de acuerdo. Yeah. Contigo, like, like Marjorie shows up, you know, in Isla Negra, and there's this guy on a stone writing. He was always writing yeah. and stuffing the papers in different places and. So it was. It's easy for uh, for some of that work to have been hidden, and there's it's voluminous, so so much, so many boxes of his work, so many things stuffed into um, the backs of books. His library was enormous. And he really was a people's poet. I mean, he, he would go, he would talk to people, he would sign anything, servilletas. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah sign napkins. I mean, he had a real competition going on with Pablo de Roca, who considered himself. The people's poet. Um. And I think, for example, I'm sorry, poem four was too long, but it's almost an ep an epic love poem, and um, it just it re these poems are really so they are one of the best of Neruda's work. So they are part of his tremendous uh, over literary over literary work. So it is so strange and perhaps so Nerudian that. They were, they, nobody saw them, really, except the eye of, of the Dioses, and who knows, you know, um, of course Matilde was very careful with her husband's work, but somehow she makes this, which is totally human, and this is maybe what they would have wanted to happen, maybe. So when did you find out that uh, they were available for translation? What was the, the process? I'm just curious. It, it was a crazy process. Um, it, uh, it was very under lock and key. It was sort of very secretive. secretive. Yeah. 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 And so when the publishers were bidding for the English contract and um, the publisher that won it, that put the bid together, uh, the best bid together, Copper Canyon, which has a long tradition of promoting Neruda's uh, books, sent um, sent an, a number of translators uh, this lock and key manuscript, um, and then we submitted translations, and mine ended up being picked. But 
the um, the way the manuscript came to me, I couldn't uh, I I could open it and read it, but I couldn't select any part of it. I couldn't alter any part of it. I couldn't copy any part. I couldn't send it to anyone. It was I'd never seen such security. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. If, um, so. Um, so I, I worked sort of laboriously on this, but also in an increasingly excited state. <laughs> yeah, because it's, very, it's a very late life. Would it be late in life, you think, or was it early in life? I mean, do you have any idea that these were written? Yeah, they were written from about um, 1952 to, we just heard one right before he dies in 1973. It's about a 25 year period there. So it's, it's you know, it's, um, Mid stride, Neruda. Yeah, it's wonderful. The, uh, you know, the thing of Neruda, he was already popular long before the Nobel Prize. I mean, everybody knew him, I think, yeah, before 1971, right? So it, it's amazing how much appeal he had to the common person, not just, you know, the literary circles. I often think about it when I walk down the street in, in the, here in Washington, and then an American writer wins a Nobel. And if I asked anybody in the street, nobody would come. Yeah. But in Latin America, if you walk down the street and somebody won a Nobel Prize, you would sure everybody would know about it. Yeah. It's an interesting observation. Don't you think? I also think towards uh, later in his life, he made a conscious decision uh, that he wanted to, to write in a way that people would find joy in, in poetry, in all the things he loved. And I still think that. For example, the olds, the Lewis olds have taught us to look at food in a different way. Uh, you know, the tomato, the, the king of the salad, or the artichoke, or the french fries. And you said your general lines that he was interested in food. Remember, you said of that. Course. that yes. uh, so food and, and animals, too. He would write about frogs, yeah. Yeah, different animals. Yeah. And most human beings are interested in food and animals. <laughs> <laughs> So I think we could open it to the public for questions. Would you identify yourself when you uh, ask a question so we know who you are? Somebody there? Uh, and I need to go over there? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, we used to, we grew up together. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate uh, uh, the reading. Uh, Marjorie, that uh, we were friendly with this. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'm curious about uh, uh, the translation, uh, about the manuscript that you find in Forest. Uh, and, and so, what's the evolution uh, and some lines that you are erased in the manuscript? So, how do you think that? Yeah, um, yeah, so that's. Part of why it's so useful to have the holographic uh, text, because in the poems um, that I'm looking at, there are lines crossed out, which um, um, which then I don't include because I think about honoring the poets. But if I have lines crossed out, I don't want Rob publishing them. <laughs> um, but it's really interesting to see it because it's the process of his thinking through. And so you get to see that with the holographic text. And yeah, Chile. So Roberto, the attaché to the, um, to the embassy of Chile, is, of course, a writer. That's who, that's who Chile sends out to its ambassadorial position. <laughs> makes me proud. <laughs> I, I got to walk, so there's this, so Neruda, after Neruda, it takes a Nicanor Para to really, you know, re-energize Chilean poetry, and maybe after Para, um, Raul Zurita, who's still alive, um, and who has Parkinson's, and I was with Zurita in Chile uh, last year with my wife, it was the last thing we did together, and walking uh, up the streets, past a bunch of bars, and um, someone at a bar uh, recognized Zorita to give you a sense of poetry's place, like Madri is saying in Chile, stood up and began an ovation, <laughs> saying, Zorita, Zorita. 
And um, other people stood up and also started clapping, just because this man was walking by. And then Zorita, who has Parkinson's, froze, because that's one of the things that happens. You, you get nervous, your body suddenly freezes, and he couldn't move. And the, the man was shouting, go forward, Zorita, go forward, you've led the way. Adelante. Yeah. <laughs> and Zorita's whispering, I'm trying. <laughs> Last year, just about this time. No, my dear. Oh, yeah, just like this. Oh, yeah. This is translator, uh -huh. who, who's a professor in Georgetown. Anna, Anna Dini, who's yeah. a great translator and who lives in that city, and just published a, a, an edition of Zurita Sotheby. Any more questions? Yes. I think you're very much. I think you're very much. Okay, I'll try. <coughs> my name is Wing Chi Chen. I'm a Chino poet. So, may I ask an outsider question? How do you translate the tones and rhymes of the original Spanish into English? <coughs> okay, and Marjorie, who is also a translator and a really good one. Um, I will, I, now I'm so glad you think so. Because <laughs> 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 I don't see myself as a translator. But you, you yeah. have, yeah. But um, uh, quickly, just want to say, we we'll mentioned, you know, and you can understand that. Uh, uh, had to move away from Isla Negra because he didn't want to be called the poet of Isla Negra because he said there was already a poet from Isla Negra. So he, you can see the strange rivalry that happens in literature. So he moved to a little nearby town called uh, Las Cruces. But I'll, I'll also like to mention Enrique, Enrique Lin. But I think he was an extraordinary Chilean poet combination of Neruda and Parra almost at the same time. But um, uh, English, of course, I ha even though I was born in the United States, I could be deported now because I have an accent. Uh, <laughs> so English is not my native language, but I've lived here long enough to, to also uh, embrace English and love the English language. But I have translated from the Spanish into the English is like I have translated from my language to another language that is not exactly my own, but I know it well. So I think that a poet like Forrest who writes in English has another sensibility when he translates, uh, let's say, Spanish-speaking poet Neruda into English. I think because you master already the language you are translated the poem into is a different experience than mine. I think that I have borrowed a little bit of the English to convey the Spanish. But, but the English, I do not feel it completely my own in a deep way, and perhaps the contribution to this conversation. In order to translate, you have to be enamored of your own native language. And I am enamored of Spanish, not of English. So I'm a halfway translator. <laughs> but the question that you ask, um, for most of the poets that I love, um, the sound and the rhythm um, make meanings equally important to the semantic meanings. So sometimes I'll even risk um, going away from a literal translation in order to capture a sound pattern that I feel carries an emotional weight that's more important. And that gets even harder with, um, with Chinese um, and, uh, and both the, the play that you can have with uh, the way a character looks and the way it can be pronounced. And then the, the rhyme, in Chinese is the easiest language in the world to rhyme in. It's not even fun to rhyme in Chinese, it's, it's too easy. Um, but in Spanish, um, I'm really listening for the sounds and, and the rhythms and trying to get those. But how is it that some people translate through informers? American poet translates Spanish, but he doesn't have to write his Spanish. I, I've known somebody like that. Yeah, we've all known somebody like that. Well, you know, I think in the old days, it was more justifiable. So that um, W.S. Merwin, who's still alive. That's the one I was thinking about, exactly. One of my, yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was one of our poets in residence. Yeah. Before the poet laureates. Uh -huh. yes. 
And he's a great poet, and he's translated from a lot of languages that he doesn't speak, uh, including Russian and, um, and a number of Asian languages, with informants. And um, those were important because there hasn't been a lot of attention. So those happened a lot in the 60s when suddenly America was waking up that, to the fact that there were other languages in the world, <laughs> and we might translate some. We you know we our production, literary production of translated works is one of the lowest percentage-wise in, in, in the world, 3%. I didn't know that, that's interesting. Yeah, it's horrible. So his translations were really important that they got done. And now there are more and more poets who do speak other languages who are capable of sort of taking, you know, taking the lead. Um, who do you translate? Marjorie? Well, I've translated uh, Gabriela Mistral, which I think is uh, talking about, when Forrest was talking about the vernacular, she uses a lot of uh, almost 19th century Spanish uh, spoken in rural communities of Chile, especially Monte uh, Grande, where she lives. Um, and I think I've, I've never um, attempted to, to translate in Lula, but then I've also done some translations of of Nicanor Parra, which is also quite complex because to convey this colloquial sense of language into, into English. I should ask you, how did you get the rights to, to translate Gabriela? I just did not pay attention to Dolly Dana, that I never answered the letters. No. Um, you know, this is an interesting story. And when <coughs> I saw, I entered the Library of Congress, I thought that uh, Gabriela could have been here on her work, her unpublished work, but she's in Chile, which I know all of you would agree that that's where she should be. Uh, but um, I think that this is a complex uh, conversation, but I think Gabriela Mistral was really not a poet that people read that much, maybe because of the complexity of the language, because she was a woman. Um, Neruda somehow, with all the love I have for him, he was a man that knew how to market himself. <laughs> and men do that better than us. So uh, Gabriela was unread, almost invisible. And then she had this very long, uh, passionate relationship with Doris Dana, the executor of her estate. And when Gabriela Mistral died, her old poetry died with her and Doris Dana because unfortunately she hoarded most of her unpublished work and she never answered the letters. So there is some, so a very uh, wonderful publisher, the, uh, small presses which are really the backbone of American poetry, white pine presses, says let's send three letters to Doris Dana. And if she doesn't answer, we have acted in good faith. <laughs> and we will just go ahead and do it. <laughs> so, you know, people are not spies of poetry. We are not that important, unless maybe it's Russian poetry. <laughs> but uh, somehow, we, we just published uh, one of the first uh, translations of Miss Dan's uh, poetry after this beautiful translation done by Langston Hughes. And now Gabriela is back in Chile. She's public domain, and um, I hope many, many people read her and and translate her because I think she would benefit from multiple translations. Gabriela recorded here in 1952 at the Library of Congress. That's the only little recording that she's made in her life. Because she was very Ah, oh, so great, Library of Congress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also, uh, she uh, she now is becoming very popular. Yeah, yeah. And she yeah. reads like Neruda. I mean, I've listened to the recording many times because at one point, it was a Year of the Woman in 75. So they made her recording into a, an old, one of those old uh, like records that they had. And so I, I listened to everything that she was saying because they had to take on all the, <gasps> the suspicions and all that. <laughs> and the, the thing that she would say, oh, I'm so tired, can we take a break? <laughs> or the, um, the car that were coming by because there was air conditioning in the building, yeah. I guess in the 50s. So you could hear the cars of the outside, you know, with the horns. So she would say, oh, I don't want to read anymore. Because at that time she was quite old, you know. So she's quite, she's a very, very good reader, fascinating. 
But she's been trying it, all of her stuff has been trying to take it, no? I think there are still more things that need to be, you know, she was a tremendous correspondent. There's quite a bit of prose. I don't know, what do you think, Roberto? There's more of Gabriela to be translated? Oh, since the government can see. Yeah. One last question. There was a question up here. I thought it was interesting, the underlying ten, I'm sorry, Conrad Daly, and I just thought this was interesting. So, um, I, I haven't read much on your river, but I thought it was interesting, and I did see the film yesterday, I you spoke, but the comments that have been made about, well, 3% are translated, uh, poet of the people, it seems to me that it's, it's different art forms for different cultures, etc. In this country, there doesn't seem to be as much of a resonance towards poetry, but then in Britain, you have more written, you have Shakespeare, etc., and you don't have as many opera stars or operas created. And I was wondering, what is it you think that makes a culture create a poet of the people? Because it's not just Latin and South America, but Ireland has its call, and uh, as, as, as Irish saw, so it resonates with me. But in America, it does seem that there's just not a space for it. And looking at the present administration, there's been lots of calls for creativity come out of it. But it's been translated into humor that's very brash and, and visceral and visible, and not into, it seems, a lot of the nuance that Neruda used during his time. Is that a time thing? Is that a culture thing? Is it all of the above? What other elements do you see creating a Neruda or the absence of a Neruda? Very very <laughs> this is a question for a seminar or a <laughs> discussion. Uh, it's true what you say, Ireland, um, of course, Russia, uh, Chile, uh, so many countries that have a, a Fraser poets and and you referring to, to the United States, which has a, an extraordinary also literary tradition that is intertwined with the Anglo-Saxon world, with the extraordinary English literature, and then why you're saying poetry doesn't have the same resonance. This is a totally uh, very personal response. It's my own. I like to just use one word, read. Poetry doesn't make money. And this is a, a highly capitalistic society. Always has been so the vocation of poetry doesn't sell, really. Uh, and I think it's very sad to speak this way, but if you look at how much money we pay as taxpayers in, for the war, and how little we pay for the National Endowment for the Arts, it may explain. And how um, I think a lot of poets, including myself, have to earn a living as a, as a college professor, because no one can survive as a poet. Uh, so it seems that the elites maintain these eccentric poets, and they do poetry readings for academic elites. But somehow, uh, I do not see a poetry of the streets, a poetry that people sing, that, that people remember. This is a highly isolationist nation, individualistic, and it has a very beautiful side, but an extremely dark one. And the dark one, perhaps, is the fact that words don't matter that much. That maybe violence matters more. Maybe sports matters more. And other countries value words in a, in a, different, in a different way. Um, you know, countries like uh, Finland or Israel, ha which are relatively small countries, have one of the largest publishing industries, and especially are the countries that have more works in translation. So, I don't know, I, I think, uh, you know, we are, we all know how much we're transforming ourselves, our politics, our history. In the 60s, there was more poetry, more song. Who knows, maybe now there will be more poetry and more song, because nothing humanizes people more than the arts. But I think that poetry, if we are interested in what is profitable. And I think we have to change and look for the food 
that will sustain your soul. And believe me, poetry is also food. I think today that there's too much television today to much noise for one thing. And for another, the Letter of Congress has a poet laureate. And this year is the Latino. It's Juan Felipe Reyes. So um, the Letter said a poet laureate, a poet in residence since the 40s, I think. And uh, so I think poetry actually is selling in the United States. Am I right or not? Yeah, I would. I, I, Though I agree with absolutely everything Marjorie said, and another an, another trajectory towards answering your question is, um, dude, you're not hanging out with the right people. <laughs> <laughs> that um, I mean that uh, one we we had Whitman, um, Whitman and Dickinson, who are sort of the diastolic and systolic pulse of uh, American literature, and um, who have influenced <coughs> international literature in every other country. And then that poetry is really alive in every city in the country. Any night, there are poetry readings. Juan Felipe Herrera is a hugely popular poet, and um, hundreds of people come to his readings. Robert Creeley, who just died, people couldn't get into you know, readings that he would give. There'd be 800 people and people standing in another room to try to hear. And Adrian Rich, also a really popular, really influential, um, poet. I, I think we have them, but it is, we get distracted because in, especially in the United States, it's, a, um, it's an epic of the spectacle. And in a way, poetry is the anti-spectacle. It's this thing that can happen all alone with you in a room with a page in front of you. And your whole, like Marjorie says, your soul can open up. Like, que milagro. What an amazing thing in this age of spectacle that that private, intimate activity can still be so powerful, and uh, it is. There are lots of poetry prizes and um, in the poetry literature sector that began in the 30s here. Am I right about that? In the 1930s? It, and so I think there's been some interest in Washington at least. Yeah. My own little town in Bethesda has a little poetry center. That's a famous one, yeah. It really is <laughs> it's like a little, little house. The writer's center, yeah. yeah. Well, with that image, and we're going to thank our poets, Mr. Jeff, for this wonderful conversation. <laughs>